Welcome back to my Exodus run through Project Zomboid. I am getting closer and closer to the point where uh, I might be ready to actually take a break and, uh, you know, and move on to some other things. Basically, we've been going through this neighborhood, trying to clear out all the nearby buildings and at the same time kill all the nearby zombies. It used to be just being in this neighborhood for more than five minutes resulted in me getting swarmed. Now I'm running into a zombie or two at a time. And if I can get enough of a buffer around my actual house, I should actually feel secure enough to feel like I've, I've got a toehold and we're ready to move on to sort of the next phase of living in West Point. So I'm going to have... Some morning stew. Mmm, delicious. And then I should, you know what? I should make I should make today's today's lunch. So let's let's fill this empty cooking pot from the bathtub. And while we are cooking, uh, so uh, Cogs, uh, during the discussion between episodes, uh, we were talking about the fact that I sort of finished up writing a uh, writing a spec for work. I wouldn't say what the spec was about, but uh, I did finish up writing a spec for work. And Cogs was, and, and I basically said that all I've got left is kind of the boring parts. You know, filling in all the details. You know, now I've described how the feature works. I've got to come up with a lot of details. Um, so the implementers know exactly what I'm looking for from the tools and, and stuff like that. And I was kind of lamenting, like, okay, that's the boring part of the document. Um, and, uh, uh, Co and Cog was suggesting, jokingly, that, like, oh, well, ChatGPT should be able to do the boring parts. And uh, and it's interesting because, you know, people are, are, are still sort of trying to figure out, let's put some oysters in this stew, people are still trying to figure out what the role of AI is in, in a process like this, in a process like, let's put some meat patty in there, in the process like, you know, writing a spec for a video game. Because I have asked ChatGPT in the past to write a spec for a video game feature. Um, and it does a decent job. It, it does sort of the same job that you'd expect from a uh, sort of an early junior designer who is still being mentored and who, you know, um, isn't going to think of anything, but will be able to put down some text describing a feature, you know, and uh, ChatGPT does about as well as that um, at sort of just coming up with some ideas, codifying them and, and, and laying them down. Now, the things it chooses are kind of arbitrary and, and usually it's not going to have a human sense for what is specifically appropriate for this game. It'll just come up with some generic stuff, some of which is good. I, I use it for brainstorming. Sometimes because like a lot of times it'll cover a lot of the boilerplate obvious stuff that I might have neglected, but it, what it won't do is come up with very specifically appropriate ideas. Things are like, oh yeah, that's the perfect answer to this problem. If it does come up with that, it's fairly random and sometimes it's kind of fun. It will have what feels like a flash of insight, um, you know, about some like, oh, I hadn't made that connection before. Um, so sometimes it will do that, but not reliably. And it's not the, ki the kind of thing where you would like assign a person to nail all of that stuff. Um, but it does all right. Uh, but the thing I would not, I would not depend on it to ever be the source of something that I turn in to somebody else. Like, like, you know, when I'm like, you know, when somebody has, has asked me to write a spec for them, I'm not going to hand them something that was written by ChatGPT because I have this sense of responsibility for the final product where it's like, I need, I need to know that I've written every word of this and that I believe every word of it and that I, I can answer questions about every part of it. Like the whole thing has to be mine. Um, and so I don't think I will ever want to use an AI as a polish pass uh, or as like the final pass on something or even just like a draft that I'm submitting. Like, like Ubisoft has been talking about using AI for the first draft of NPC barks and things like that. And while ChatGPT can be a good source for NPC barks, if you say, you know, if you, if you tell it, hey, I need to come up with 20 things that an NPC who has this identity and is in this situation might say, It'll come up with some good stuff. Wait, I don't want to eat this yet. Do I? Did I just? I just ate. Did I just eat? I don't remember now. Whatever. I just ate again. Um, but uh, it'll come up with some pretty decent stuff. But not all of it will be what you want. And uh, you know, and for me, just if I'm gonna be producing a draft of something for somebody else, I do not want it to be ChatGPT's draft. I would love to use ChatGPT to just sort of like throw some ideas at me that I can take or leave, but ultimately, I always feel like I need to be the one who is responsible for what gets handed to another person with my name on it. So, so yeah, so I really like Chat... I mean, ChatGPT is uncannily good at doing what it's good at, and it's, and it's actually just freakishly 
weird and fun to play with because it's so disconcerting. It's actually, you know what, I like ChatGPT, I think, for the same reason. That, like, when some people are like, you know, oh, you know, if you're a real movie lover, you will always turn off the, like, action smoothing or whatever. You'll always turn off the thing that transforms it from 30 frames a second or 24 frames a second into 60 frames a second because whatever it makes it look like a garbage soap opera but for me i actually really like i like it when an ai is doing something weird to the image on the screen and making it different from what it would have been before like it's just it's interesting to me to sort of stare at it and be weirded out by the fact that this thing that was shot in 24 frames a second is now 60 frames a second for me that's it's so bizarre i just like it's like it's another layer of entertainment on top of the entertainment that I'm enjoying. So I always leave that stuff on if I can. I really like it. Um, but I totally understand why a lot of people don't like it. It's not like, you know, this is just the way I am. I'm a weirdo. And so I like ChatGPT for a lot of those same reasons. It's just like, wow, a robot did this? An AI did this? How? How is that even possible? And just marveling at that is just kind of a fun hobby by itself. Is that another freaking crowbar? This guy's got another freaking crowbar. Check out this nonsense. I've got so many crowbars. Well, we'll see if I have this one. Maybe I'll get killed by these zombies. Who knows? Um, so anyway, so that's my attitude towards ChatGPT. I really like it as a tool, but I don't think it replaces me being responsible for a document and 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 and, and you know writing it up the way that I would write it up. And and similarly, you know. AI artists like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion and you know and, and you know Dolly, uh, those guys like. Oh, I thought I heard a door bang, but I don't think I did. Um, like, I don't think they replace artists any more than than I think ChatGPT replaces me. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know basically you know for the same reason that I wouldn't turn in a document that was written by ChatGPT. I would presume that an artist would not want to turn in a piece of art that was just made by Midjourney and say, yep, this is my submission for the concept art, you know? Um, and, and I don't think as, as a, a leader on a team, as somebody who's like, if I were, you know, in charge of a game development team, I also wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want somebody to just be using Midjourney to create our art. I mean, it's, it's a definitely, it's a useful tool for early concepting, for brainstorming, for just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and, and, and collectively deciding what's what's sticking. Like, it can be valuable for stuff like that, but I wouldn't want somebody to submit a piece of concept art that was, that, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't full of human intent, you know? Like, I, I want that kind of thing to be just saturated with humans having agreed, you know, to, like, this is what we're building and this is what we want. Um... Let's see if I can get in through this. I can see a zombie over here. Okay, sometimes the soundtrack will sound a little bit like, oh, hello, there's more zombies over here. I was about to seriously go inside that building and then try to run out its front door just to get the door open and attract the zombie outside. That would have walked me straight into a horde I didn't know was there. Uh, that would have been pretty funny. Yeah, sorry, by, by the way, sorry that I'm not reading the chat right now. Um, I'm sure you all have very clever things to say. Um, but I've just been feeling like I was in danger this whole time, and so I didn't want to glance over. But I will catch up with what you're saying in just a second, because I'm sure that somebody is saying something. But yeah, so like when artists, you know, are feeling like, you know, understandably are feeling like, oh no... You know, these tools could make it so that people feel like they don't need artists anymore. So I guess I'm just sort of attesting that while I'm not the only person who would be making decisions like this, and there probably are people out there who would look to cut costs by trying to use Midjourney in place of a real artist, um, you know, at least for, for projects the scale of, you know, like uh, what I'm working on, or just now, even if I was working on a small indie project, like I, as sort of a leader on a, on a, game development team, I just, I would not want to replace a person with a tool like that. I would love to accelerate a person with a tool, give them tools that make them able to do more with less. Like, that that seems really valuable, but I would always want the person there, making the decisions and uh, sort of putting, putting their vision and their ability to collaborate with me 
into the process. So let's kill the zombie or zombies in this building. And then, before scavenging, I will check out the chat and see what you have all been saying about this topic. Uh, we just gotta make sure that I'm not about to get snuck up on by a zombie. Okay, nothing in there. Nothing in there. I think there's nothing in here. Okay, yeah, there's properly nothing in here. Oh, well, there's something. Which is yet another gun. I am assembling quite the arsenal right now, which is great. Okay, I'm feeling secure enough. Let's catch up with the chat. Let's see here. Okay, so we've got it. Okay, we have got a poll right now that La Coalition is running asking what challenge I should do in Project Zomboid in the future. Should I raid the military base, raid the prison, or try to make a base in Louisville? And right now they're all evenly matched. So uh, if you've got an opinion about that, please weigh in because it would be really funny if they all end up staying even. But it might be kind of cool to see what my audience is interested in, uh, in, in me doing. So let's see what else. Um, oh, so Goombuggy wants to know, random thought, does the zombie virus attack fishes or sea dwellers? Uh, so it, it really, you know, whether or not zombieism affects uh, animals at all is, is, is really varies widely from uh, zombie IP to zombie IP. Yay, pipe wrench. Um, you know, some really love sort of like putting zombie animals in. In fact, you know, we, you know, in the trailer for State of Decay 3, we depict a zombie animal, but you'll note that we depict it for the first time in the franchise. Prior to that trailer, there was no indication that uh, that zombies, that, that, you know, the zombie infection could affect uh, animals. And that was intentional. We, we deliberately did not make it about animals. In fact, we kind of liked the idea of... Um, nature being pretty pristine, that this is something that's affecting humans and human civilization, and it's particularly good at taking down human civilization, and it's about us sort of contending with our mortality and with, like, the fact that, you know, we, that, you know, the world might survive without us, you know, that, that, that history might not be all about us, it might move on without us, and uh, the world will be fine, but we will be gone. It makes us sort of, like, question our own value and our own mortality, which is actually, you know, one of the... Uh, things that we're talking about with AI, sort of that, that, that anxiety you get when you think about, you know, am I really necessary anymore? And, uh, you know, one thing that sort of a zombie world like this, particularly one where the zombieism does not affect animals, does make you sort of think about like, okay, what is the world like without humans? And what does it mean if we're gone? You know, so I kind of like that. Um, and also, uh, Fogey, my uh, old uh, design director, uh, he would make the point that, you know what? Animal predators are scary enough without being zombies. A bear does not need to be a zombie to be scary because it's a bear. You know, a dog, like a wild dog, does not need to be a zombie to be scary because it's a wild dog. Uh, and those are already scary with or without a zombie, you know, infection. So I'm going to carry a bunch more stuff than I can actually hold. Um, and we're going to head straight back to our base. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Is there a little bit more in here than I noticed? Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of fresh food that's going to be useless soon. Oh, that stuff will fit in my backpack. Interest. Oh, but this stuff won't. Okay. Well, we're going to carry way too much crap, and we're going to get out of here. Is this? Yes. Back door? Cool. Hopefully, we won't run into any zombies. Oh, hey. Yay. Sprinting skill. So Goonbuggy says that wild dogs are not actually that scary unless there's a pack of them. I guess it depends on the game. If I encountered a single wild dog that was interested in attacking me, I would be plenty scared uh, in real life. Because they are... I mean, dogs are tailor-made to make sure a bite happens when they want it to happen. Um, and so for me, as, you know, like, like I, I would feel very much like I was extremely vulnerable to that happening, uh, to, you know, I do not have a lot of instincts that are based around not allowing a dog to bite me. Um, and if, if it is, you know, a wild dog, I mean, those tend to carry disease, you know, and there could be something worse than just the bite going on when the bite happens. So, um, 
Senior Sausage asks, can we add a mini gun that has it that has infinite bullets? Um, so when we were we at one point we did talk about the possibility of um, of including like vehicle mounted weapons in the game. You know, like having uh, you know a, a vehicle that's got a turret in the top that uh, that, that, that fires you know whatever like like a, like a thirty or a fifty cal uh, machine gun up on a vehicle. And uh, we ended up deciding against uh, doing it for various reasons. A lot of them having to do with animation budgets, stuff like that. Um, but when we were thinking about how to do that, uh, I had actually been thinking of, rather than loading specific bullets into it, uh, I had been thinking of actually just having you load an ammo rucksack into it as its magazine, basically. So you just put an entire rucksack of ammo um, into uh, into like a certain slot in the vehicle's inventory, and that's what get gets used by the mounted weapon. Um, and I similarly felt like if we ever were to add a um, uh, a, a flamethrower to the game, my suggestion was that we could actually add a uh, basically have the ammunition for it be you've got a rucksack on your back full of fuel and you basically use the rucksack as your ammunition um i liked that idea oh it looks like we can't fit the rifle in here i've already filled up this 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 weapon thing you can put the crowbar in there yeah so we're already to the point now where like i have to start putting my guns in weird places so i'll just put on the ground for now probably sometime off stream I will probably reorganize this house before I uh, sort of leave it for a while, just to make sure that things are easy, are easy to find. Um, oh, that, that will probably involve just picking a room to fill with guns and then not putting guns in the, uh, in the same place as all of my other weapons. Because guns can be pretty heavy and take up a lot of space in this game. Let's see here. So, oh, so going back to the topic of, of using AI tools, uh, Senior Sausage says, I do understand what you mean, uh, even though I'm not a developer, but I would also feel very sad at the fact of using a tool rather than a person's talent. Yeah, so, yeah, for me, like, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the effort going into the creation of video game tools over the past many years uh, has been focused on creating shortcuts where basically, like, the tool knows how to make a certain kind of thing and so therefore, you know, the, the person who's normally, who's traditionally, whose job it would be to just make hundreds of very similar things can instead let a tool do that part for them. And then they do the really interesting part. So like, for you know, placing, creating a building, if you can have a tool that knows how to do all of the, you know, how to size all of the windows so they all line up, who knows how to put like the trim around the windows, who knows how to, you know, like, like just make sure that everything sort of works, then as an artist, you know, who could make that entire, spend days making that entire building themselves, they can just decide the size and shape and layout of the building and then be done because the tool did all of the rest of that work for them. And it's not like the, you know, and if you can make the tool right in a way that it's, it's customizable so that it's doing exactly what the artist wants it to do, then the artist can, you know, uh, can basically can take can take that time they would have spent meticulously making every single piece of trim around every window and put that time into something that is broadly more entertaining to the artist, you know, something that is more fun for them to do. Um, I'm just going to set this soap right here. Um, and the bath towel goes out here. And so I like it for that reason. So basically, if we consider AI artists... Um, and, and AI text generators and stuff like that to be that kind of tool where it's the kind of tool that that someone who is already a professional in that field uses to shortcut the stuff that would just be time consuming for them. If we use it like that, then I think it's great. It's still, you know, like you still have that, the, get a lot of the same benefits from something having been made by a person because it was intentionally made by, a, by someone, uh, you know, who has skill in that, in that area. Um, they they you know purposefully decided I'm going to make this thing this way, but I'm going to use a tool that makes it happen faster than if I made it myself. Um, and I'm going to you know curate it, and I'm going to like you know pay attention to it. I'm going to make sure that it's making exactly what I want. 
but uh, but I'm going to do it much faster. And then, rather than making one building every two days, I'm going to make eight buildings in a day. You know, and so we can get from zero to from zero to city much faster. And it, when we talk about sort of artists, you know, the question of artists losing their jobs because of this, that does mean that you could make a city of the same size with fewer artists because each artist could do more. Um, and so if you purely, basically, if, if what you decide to believe is that video games will always be the same size with the same amount of, uh, of content um, and that people will just make them with fewer artists, that is certainly one direction it could go. And there could be certain teams that go exactly that way, where, you know, they will basically make games the same size for cheaper. But if you can make games the same size for cheaper, that also means that the person who's funding your games can fund more games. They can take more shots on goal. You know, they can uh, reduce... Oh, gosh, no! Oh, get the crap off me! Whoa, I hate... I hate coming up the stairs because of that. Weirdly, I was not injured by that. It's very strange I was not injured. I'm pretty sure they damaged my clothing. He must have just bit me on the head or something. Yeah, okay, my legs are damaged. He must have just bit me on the head where I've got, like, a really, really good helmet. Um, because that absolutely... That absolutely should have been terrible for me. That should have been the end of my adventure. Uh... <laughs> That was ridiculous. Oh, look, a gun case. Um, wow, that was nuts. <laughs> yeah, Randolph Court says, oh, it bit you on the head, but there's not much of there, so it's okay. Yes, yes, that's what I was implying. Um, but anyway, I want to tell the other side of that. So, so there is a scenario where you make the same scope of game and you just do it with fewer artists. But... Then the same publisher who's or investor of whatever kind can make more games and there can be more game teams out there hiring artists, uh, you know, to, to, to just make more stuff. Or one thing that people also want to do is make games with prodigious amounts of content that that, you know, you could never see before. Like, you know, I could see, you know, people making maps that that really, really use you know procedural generation tactics and AI artists to um, to make the map two, three times times as big, you know, four or five times as big as previous maps with the same number of artists as before. So the scenario where you just hire fewer artists to make the same amount of stuff, that's one scenario and a version of that will play out on the micro scale. But I think on the macro scale, I think we're going to still see a lot of demand for, 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 for artist skills. I think we're still going to see a ton of, um, of artists being hired to do what I hope is, you know, because of the existence of tools like this, what I hope is more interesting jobs. Um, you know, where I'm, it would be really neat if rather than an artist needing to pay their dues by doing really boring, obnoxious jobs on a game team, you know, like just I'm the artist who's in charge of making all, making sure all the grass is in good places, making sure all the potholes on on the roads in Grand Theft Auto are pleasingly placed, rather than being that are th doing that job as an entry level artist um, and having to sort of pay your dues doing really really obnoxious boring stuff if tools solved a lot of those problems then as an entry level artist you might actually be asked to do a more interesting job you know you wouldn't necessarily because if, if robots are doing all of those you know those sort of crap by rote jobs then somebody who just got out of art school might actually be asked to make something interesting um, and could end up sort of like enjoying their job more than they would have if they'd just been hired, you know, to be a, you know, like a, a, a pothole monkey. Um, so anyway, so, so that's my thought. On that. That, that's the reason why, you know, while I still, you know, I do like listen and, and take seriously sort of the, the, the worries and concerns of a lot of my artist friends uh, who, who, who feel, you know, legitimate, understandable anxiety about AI artists. Um, that's why I think this is actually going to be good. This is why I think this is actually... You know, while, while I'm not going to you know, dismiss the possibility that there could be downsides to this uh, and, and this could negatively impact some people's experiences as artists. Um, and certainly, the, and this is not even getting into sort of the freelance art space, which has, you know, separate concerns of its own. Um, I do think that there's reason to be actually hopeful about the impact this is going to have on artists' careers rather than just being doom and gloom about it. Um... 
Coolissimo asked you, couldn't an entry level student also use like um, uh, AI generated images and then fix them with Photoshop? Yeah, that, that, that yeah, that is another thing that yeah, that's like. It's difficult to collaborate with an AI artist to give it f specific feedback on a picture. Like ChatGPT is better at this. ChatGPT, um, you know, if if it makes something you don't love, you can be like, oh hey, can you replace? Can you come up with something new for this particular thing? Can you go back to a thing you just wrote and actually change it in this small way? It's so good at parsing text and everything that like it can do exactly what you ask it to do. Um, in that regard, AI artists so far have not been great at that. It's hard to give them extremely specific direction and and have that turn into something that you want. Um, depending on what a power user you are of more flexible tools like Stable Diffusion, you can do a little more of that in some cases than others. But still, it's it's hard to get exactly what you want uh, from an AI. It usually, that's one reason why it's good for like concepts and brainstorming is because a lot of times what you're looking for in the, from those kinds of processes is being surprised by weird ideas out of the blue. And that's what it'll do. It'll give you a lot of weird things out of the blue that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. But um, but if you're actually trying to zero in on something specific, then an AI artist is going to do a terrible job of that a lot of the time. Uh, it's not going to give you what you need to make that happen. Uh, and so that's one of the values of having you know an actual artist using is that, you know, an AI artist might get you most of the way there, but be a little bit wrong. And then rather than trying to iterate on it, like, and just like hit the randomize button again and again and again on the AI artist to try to make something happen, a skilled artist can just take the thing the AI gave them and then make it exactly what they need. You know, and be like, okay, look, well, this is almost there, but there's these three things that are wrong with it. I'll just use my art skills to change those three things. And then it's exactly what people are looking for. And I'm responsible for it. The same way that, you know, I would write the final draft of a document that was originally, you know, sort of brainstormed by, the, 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 and I might incorporate, what the heck? I might incorporate some chat GPT ideas into it, but I'm responsible for the final version. And, and that's, that's what I would focus on creating. All right. So I can't read back anything else in the chat right now because zombies and because I've definitely proven that I am capable of being hit by these zombies. These ones are not upstairs, but I, I, definitely stairs do seem to be my um, nemesis in this game. Because I remember Shonda got in some very serious trouble one time when she was cleaning out that apartment complex. Because she kept having to go upstairs and kept being surprised by how many freaking zombies were on each subsequent floor of the apartment building she was trying to clear out. Okay, so I thought that because, you know, that, that, that there weren't going to be any zombies around here, and therefore it would be okay for me to go out despite the fact that my character is kind of tired. Uh, but no, Zomboid is always able to surprise you. Take your assumptions and squish them. Oh, I love this crowbar, and I'm so sad that I'm using its durability on a tired fight. Oh, gosh. Okay, come on. Come on, some of you die. You're zombies. Dying is, your like, your specialty. Oh, wait, no, killing is your specialty. Dying is... Dying is like what you minor in. You major in killing. I forgot about that. All right. Take that. Oh, another one? I thought I was done. Fine, you too. At some point, I really should just run around and just steal all these zombies' clothes. <laughs> so that I can use them to practice tailoring. Okay, okay, we're done. Um... What do I have? What do I have in the way in my inventory? Nothing. Okay, it looks like I'm doing fine. Let's let's get back into the house, and I'm sure I've missed a ton in the chat. So let's get back into the house. And, oh, let's keep reading that cooking book. Let's keep reading that cooking book. We'll read this. We will sit down so that we can. Get rid of this exertion moodle. And let me catch up with what... I'm sure I missed a bunch of stuff in the chat. 
Oh, so Cogs points out, have you seen the new uh, Unreal Engine 5 stuff on IGN? The, uh, the Jungle Drive? video yeah that's amazing uh so yeah he says that it's highlighting some of the stuff i'm talking about yeah so basically you know they, they're they're demoing a lot of uh, procedural generation tools where basically a tech artist can make a bunch of rules for how trees are distributed in a certain space how you know uh like when you place a rock next to another rock what does that you know what, what does that do that sort of thing like makes a bunch of rules for how the procedural generation works and then a level artist goes in and just moves around like the, the key pieces and a lot of the blanks just sort of get filled in around the outside and they're capable of in the same space making a lot of handcrafted art and then that and then the procedural art knows how to interact with the handcrafted art so it all looks seamless you can't as a player tell where the handcrafted art that was specifically designed for a certain experience leaves off and the procedural art picks up uh, which means that one artist can make a big voluminous complex level with you know much less time going into it than if they were handcrafting every single uh, polygon of the thing. Uh, which, is yeah, that's very, very cool. I love it. Um, let's see here. I'm just scrolling back to make sure I haven't missed everything. Oh, so Enigma, going back to the topic of zombies, uh, of animals being affected, Enigma said, I've always thought when it comes to zombie apocalypses and animals, there probably would be some zombified animals from among domestic animals that do not avoid humans, but amongst wild animals, th they avoid us anyway, so I imagine they would avoid zombies too. That's a good point, actually. That, yeah, like animals that cozy up to, like, that maybe the infection might work on animals generally, but that a typical animal is so good at avoiding humans most of them just would not get infected um, if humans are the primary you know, vector for it. I guess if they can spread it to each other, that might be different. Uh, but if humans are the main vector for the disease, uh, th that could be a good explanation for why domestic animals might get it and wild animals might not. Um, and also because a lot of human plagues do come from like uh, domesticated animals. Um, you can you can sort of like imagine there might be similarities between our physiology that you know if if the zombie you know, uh, uh, infection of whatever nature it has, if it was something that, you know, uh, that, that jumps species, you know, based on the same, the same reasoning that another, that the diseases that we already have jump species, uh, that I imagine that, yeah, it, it, it might have an easier time going from domestic species to humans and back again, uh, than, than other ways. So Captain Binky, oh, hey, Captain Binky, I didn't even know you were here. Hello, Captain Binky. Uh, Captain Binky uh, uh, is, is, one of the, is one of the developers of this game. He says, I think you need moments of serenity to really underline the horror. So that classic moment of survivor stumbles across a deer in the for forest, and then the presence of a zombie reminds him, if everything is zombified, then there's no contrast, in my opinion. That's a really, really good point, actually. So, And actually, that's one of the ways that, you know, that on State of Decay, we have thought about it, where it's like, and we're continuing to think this way uh, to some degree. The idea that like human places are scary in a zombie apocalypse, but non-human places should be less scary. It doesn't mean that they're completely, you know, empty of zombies. But I think one of the mistakes we made in State of Decay 2 is the fact that our our zombie spawning system is fairly homogenous. Like it, you do get a few more zombies in the t in the cities than you get in the countryside. But when you go out to the countryside, like one of the problems that I often have when I'm streaming, if I want to stop somewhere safe and read chat. I try to drive out away from the cities and I just keep running into a certain sort of baseline number of zombies out there in the wilderness. And, uh, you know, and we've been thinking a lot about the fact that that's actually a suboptimal experience. Like you want to have some place that's kind of safe to go to. And it, you know, if, if it's, if it's so safe that you're like, well, just avoid the cities and then there's no apocalypse, you know, you don't want it to be that safe, uh, but you do want there to be a sense of like, you know, there's places with more zombies and places with less, so I can decide on the risk and reward. Like the places I want to go are the places that have a lot of zombies because all the best prizes are there. Uh, but I decide when I want to go there and it don't have to have, like just, if it's just like, as Captain Mickey said, if it's just all zombies all the time, every second, there's no way to surprise the player or shock the player or like, you know, um, like um, violate their expectations in fun and entertaining ways because they're just always expecting the thing that's just happening all the time anyway. You need to have places that are safer and expectations that are that are lower for danger. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, let's see here. 
Uh, yeah. So Enigma pointed out um, when I was talking about flamethrowers that uh, having a backpack full of fuel, what could go wrong? Right. Exactly. It would be kind of funny. It's like if, if there was more um, uh, sort of human interaction, uh, human conflict in State of Decay, it might be, have been kind of fun to have something like a flamethrower with a uh, big tank of gas and have, you know, being able to sort of uh, to shoot it and ex cause an explosion. That could be a lot of fun. Um, unless it happened to you, then it would not be. Let's see here. Um... <laughs> okay, so Senior Sausage says, funny enough, that, going back to talking about AI art, that's what we're using in my college. Uh, we take images that AI made, and then we trim and polish them. So, okay, that, that actually does sound, it sounds like an interesting way to sort of train new artists. So even though I think that, you know, artists are definitely going to need to be trained to be able to create art from scratch. That's not something you want to skimp on. Um, you know, a lot of the work that artists do day to day, you know, is actually taking old images and editing them in new ways, uh, polishing them, that sort of thing. And so for doing that kind of work, I could totally see the, the, the value of using AI in that setting to sort of generate some sort of random and surprising, um, uh, you know, images that have problems in them, that predictably have problems in them, that, uh, that then it could be the responsibility of an artist to like identify what's wrong with the AI art, what's not entertaining about it, or what's inaccurate about it, or feels disconcerting about it. Recognizing that stuff and making the improvements they need to make. Because like a lot of the time, I think it'd be easy when you're making something from scratch to be blinded a little bit by your own intentions and miss your own mistakes. Um, and so training somebody to just look a lot of, at a lot of images with mistakes and figure out how to improve them and polish them could also make them better at doing their own work, uh, at their at their own art. Um, let's see here. Like Coalition wants to know if I still have that bloody gas mask I picked up. I do. I'm wearing safety goggles right now, but basically I was going to wait until the winter time to dress up as a firefighter, but I've got all of the firefighter gear right here in this wardrobe. So yeah, I can definitely do that at some point. Lacolison wants to know if I can clean it. Why? I mean, yes, I think I can. Let's see. I think I would want actually the desert boots with it. I mean, sure, I'm happy to clean it. I think that I've still got enough water in the bathtub to do it. Um, but I don't know why you want me to. But sure, I'll. I will. If that's your thing, if that's what you like to watch people do on videos, <laughs> then I'm perfectly happy to. Let's wash this firefighter jacket. La Coalition says, I don't think it's healthy to wear a bloody ass mask. So you're basically just as as La Coalition, which is very, you know, uh, gas masks are a huge part of your whole deal. You just want to make sure that I'm representing good gas mask hygiene. That makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. Oh, no, there's a bot in the chat. Kill it, La Coalition. Kill it. Kill it with fire. So yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna wash all of this uh, firefighter gear. Where's here's my gas mask? Oh, looks like Ranith Cord beat Colosseum to it. We we had, we had a race between the mods, and it looks like Ranith Cord is the winner. Uh, so let's wash the firefighter helmet as well. <laughs> it was one of those "Do you want to be famous?" Uh, spams, which is just I don't know. I. I definitely do not do this because I want to be famous. <laughs> That's just not not part of the consideration for me. And so whenever someone's like, hey, want to be famous? I'm like, uh, nope. <laughs> I want to have this little community of people who I get to hang out with. I like these people. They're fun. Um... And that's about it. <laughs> I'm not looking to be. I'm not looking to be like the most famous Twitch streamer in the world because that sounds miserable. Like the feelings I've been talking about around you sort of feeling a sense of kind of obligation around playing, you know, games that I've been playing for a long time, like, you know, State of Decay. I love the fact that this that this Twitch stream motivates me to play State of Decay because I absolutely need to be keep keep playing it. I will lose track of what's good about the game, my game if I'm not playing it all the time. So that's really valuable. But, you know, that's basically me using Twitch as a as like a, a stick, basically, to like whip myself into doing something that I think I should do that I otherwise might skimp on. You know, I probably would not be interested, like on a, at the end of sort of a, a hard day, I would not be interested in sitting down and playing State of Decay 2. The fact that I have this stream motivates me to play that game. because, And I think it's good for me, which, which is why I do it. But 
that same kind of negative motivation where I'm just like saying, okay, you have to do this. You've got an obligation, Jeffrey, to play this game. Um, it works on State of Decay 2, and I do I do have fun. It's not like I'm not having fun. It's just not the first thing I would do because I'm highly familiar with that game, and there's a lot of other games out there I'd want to play. Um, but that same thing, like any other game that I start streaming a lot that people get into, that I get a lot of views on YouTube for, I start feeling those same sorts of extrinsic motivations to play the game, which does undermine the fun. Um, and so that's like one reason why, you know, like Project Zomboid, I want to take a little bit of a break from it because, you know, as it's becoming like more and more of a regular part of my streaming output, it's starting to like uh, to become less fun because it becomes a job. And so uh, and so what I'm going to do is take a break from it, maybe play it on my own, get back that sense of, of just unadulterated fun. And then, you know, at some point in the future, come back and start streaming it again. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, so if I but if I were like a full time professional Twitch streamer, I would really worry about that happening to all games. Like me just not enjoying video games anymore at all, because I have to constantly be responding to those extrinsic motivators. Those like you have to stream this popular game because that's what's going to get you attention. That sort of thing. Like making my job about that would make me miserable and make me not enjoy video games anymore. So this is the right balance. This is just motivating enough. For me to, you know, uh, for me to play State of Decay 2, which I think is really important for me to do. And it does motivate me to try out a bunch of games that fans of State of Decay 2 are interested in. So that's really good, too. But I'm not so serious about it because I'm not trying to make money at it. I'm not so serious about it that I have to, I feel like I have to chase the hot thing all the time. I actually can take a step back from Project Zomboid if it's starting to feel like I've got the wrong motivations to play it. I can take a step back, play other things for a while and come back to it because I'm not dependent on the views on my channel being particularly high. I get more views on my Project Zomboid videos than practically everything else besides State of Decay 2. The, my audience on YouTube really likes watching Project Zomboid. And I bet they all also watch, you know, a lot of other Zomboid players, like, I don't know, Mr. Atomic Duck and, and, and stuff like that. I bet they really like Zomboid uh, and, and like watching people play it. Um, I, I mean, I watch, I actually, it, it, Zomboid is actually one of the few games where I will watch people play it on YouTube videos. I don't actually watch a lot of live streams or a lot of um, uh, gaming YouTube, but I do watch Zomboid because it's really interesting. Um, so uh, good on you, Captain Binky, for uh, having made a game that can entertain me in a lot of different ways. Um, but, and so if I were motivated, like if like I had to keep my view counts up, I would have to play Project Zomboid into the ground until I got sick of it. But I don't have to. I can just keep loving Project Zomboid as a player because I can take breaks from it. So that's nice. So yeah, so I do not want to be a famous streamer. I do not want to be somebody whose career is streaming. I want this to stay a hobby for as long as possible. Let's see here. Um, so Goonbuggy says with State of Decay 2, I better finish Heartland before they drop that update. Yeah, that's true. Basically, I've got until May to finish Heartland because I do want to... Basically, okay, so here's here's one reason. I want to wait until May and then jump into uh, my next sort of standard State of Decay 2 playthrough. It's because I was in the lethal zone with the commune and a, and a siege started the moment I arrived. I'm pretty sure that sieges work differently now in update 33, which means that that siege that started the moment I, I, I jumped over to, uh, to a new map and a new difficulty level with the commune, I'm betting that siege doesn't happen. Uh, in the version where I started up again with update 33. So yeah, I I definitely think that update 33 is when I should switch back to my my usual uh, uh, st State of Decay 2 BS rather rather than being in Heartland still. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, Good Buggy's making whip sounds at me. Um, so uh, so. Captain Binky cracks his knuckles and say, "So you're you're saying you want a different motivation to play Project Zomboid? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do want a different motivation. But the motivation, my motiv motivation is, I'm just stumbling over my words now. Uh, my motivation is, I just love your game. I just freaking love your game, and I want to play it for love instead of playing it for obligation. That's what I want. Uh, so there you go. Do 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 do." Oh, so Coalition points out that actually um, one edge that he has since he's, you know, he's building a career as a Mexican e-celebrity is that things like Twitch and YouTube pay in dollars. And because of the sort of, you know, economic differences and exchange rates and things, 
his dollars that he gets from uh, from running La Coalition uh, is actually it, it, it's worth more to him than it would be if he was an American doing the same thing. I kind of I kind of like that actually. That's really kind of cool that that folks in in, in other countries can sort of get more out of being entertainers uh, with with sort of uh, in in, uh, in in areas that were sort of founded in the in, in the United States. Um, that I, I I like that. I don't know for some reason that just feels nice and, and and balanced. That for one thing it means that you know folks over here in the U.S. where a lot of this money is 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 sort of coming from, we get to enjoy a lot of stuff from places that we've never been. You know, one of my favorite things I, I've talked about this before about streaming services like Netflix is that they are they're getting so many uh, shows from around the world, places that I would never have been able to watch TV from these places uh, before. I get to see it, and so a lot of this American money that's going into paying for Netflix is funding all of this work that's going on all over the world. And then I get to enjoy things like Squid Game and um, and 3% and Dark and, you know, whatever. Stuff from just all over, you know, different places in the world. So, let's see here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So... You know, uh, Captain Mickey, I've never actually watched. So, uh, average Twitch user was asking Captain Mickey when their next regular live stream is. Because they, they call them Thursoids. I think Thursdoids or something like that. Um, which is like these Thursday streams that they do where they sort of like show what's what's coming and what's new in Project Zomboid. Uh, and he says next Thursday, which is good. I've never actually watched some of those live. I've just watched um, recaps of them, basically, from folks like Mr. Atomic Duck. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's cool that you all do that. I, I really like that, that, that my studio does sort of regular live streams to connect with the audience and listen to them and sort of give them sort of firsthand input, you know, uh, or, or about, you know, what's, what's going on. And, uh, so I really love that your team does that too. I think, I think it's a really good practice. I think more studios should do that sort of thing. Oh, so Captain Beaky says, actually, they're not streams. They're blog posts. I didn't realize. See, I just assumed they were streams because sometimes uh, folks like Mr. Tom, like, well, they'll end up with video that they're showing from one of them. But I guess you probably just post video in the blog posts. That makes more sense to me because I've never actually seen a clip of one of you talking about it. That was just a misinterpretation that I did. But still, I'm glad that you regularly communicate with your audience. That's really good. That was the point, not it being a stream. That's not the thing that's important about it. It's the fact that you're connecting regularly and keeping people posted and, and basically making yourself the main source of, of information about the game. Because I, th I think that's that's really good. It's very easy for sort of like um, uh, for a lot of that sort of communication to come through like middlemen, basically, um, you know, to sort of like, oh, I want to get more coverage. So let's let IGN do a feature about it. But I really I think there's something more personal and it's sort of better a connection that comes out of doing that communication yourself or doing that communication through your own community, uh, sort of boosting the people in your community uh, rather than, you know, because those are the folks that you know, they, they sort of have this, they are a community. They have this sort of sense of trust with each other and trust with you. Um, and I, I don't know. I just, I just think that's a really good way to operate. Yeah. So Captain B says, yeah, none of us like particularly being on camera. That's the edge that I have. Uh, <laughs> It's the fact that for some stupid reason, even though like I, you know, I, I am terrible at reading the chat and I constantly mumble and I say, uh, and I'm not like a polished broadcaster. And, and, and I think that oftentimes I can be a little bit embarrassing. Um, I still really like being on camera. I don't know. I'm just staring at myself in OBS. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm on camera. Uh, for some reason, that's just like on a, some weird emotional level. I enjoy that. <laughs> I like public speaking. I like performing. And, and and not for a particular reason. Like, if you ask me, why do you like public speaking? Why do you like performing? Why do you like being on camera? I have literally no idea. My brain's just happy when I'm doing it. So I do it. Uh, it makes me tired after a while, but, like, so do lots of things that people enjoy doing. Like, um, jogging. You know, some people really like jogging, get a lot out of it. And uh, they're tired afterwards. And it's the same thing for me. I get socially and mentally tired after doing something like this. But I really love it. And I'm not exactly sure why. People come up with like, per, like pejorative, they, like, you know, ways that like, oh, he just likes to hear himself talk, or he just likes to look himself in the mirror. He's so vain. I don't think it's any of those. It's a, it, like people who don't like being on camera and don't like performing. I think that it's very easy to sort of come up with reasons why people who do are bad people. Um, I, I don't think that's fair. Uh, so, um, yeah. Anyway, there we go. I think I think we're probably done with this episode, right? Um, uh, Senor Sausage says, 
Uh, that's one entire, one reason I love you guys at Undead Labs. You guys actually talk with your community, with the people that play your games and just enjoy it. Yeah, so, I, I, same. That's one of the reasons I love working at Undead Labs. One of the first things they asked me to do was write a blog post about what I was going to be working on next. And I was just like, wait, you trust me to communicate with the audience? I'm a new hire. You've never worked with me before. And you're just having me talk to the audience? But you're going to want to, like, vet everything I say, right? And they're like, I mean, sure, we'll read it, but, like, we hired you because we want to put you on this and you should be the one talking to the audience. And I was like, this is so weird and so cool. I love it. Um, so yeah. Uh, Cogs asked if, uh, if I'll be streaming with the kids tonight. I don't think so. I think we've been trying to go every other week with the kids. We'll see though. If Milo looks like he's going to be unmanageable without streaming, we'll, we'll have to see. It just depends. Like if, if he, you know, we have to be very cautious, right? Because if you make a kid think that they can whine their way into getting what they want, then they'll just whine all the time and they'll learn the wrong lessons. But if you can manage it and like manage to suss out what they're going to be like uh, and figure out like, okay, if I just do a couple of nice things for them right now, will I skip a tantrum without giving them any wrong lessons? And if you can do that, Sometimes you will. So sometimes I'll give them a little bit more than I think they probably should have because it's just easier for everyone and I've found the right way to finagle it so I'm not teaching them any bad lessons. However, if Milo just flips out about not streaming tonight, I probably have to then stick to my guns and not stream with him because, you know, yeah. Anyway. And, you know, uh, one thing that I always say at the beginning of a Milo stream is, you know, uh, you know, Milo was very good in school this week um, uh, or very good about school this week. And that's why he gets to stream. Um, he, he wasn't very good about school this week. <laughs> so so that might be a, a good reason not to do it. Um, oh, so Outward Cypress wants to know if there's any news about State of K3. Not really. Nope. Uh, we're not really in a position right now to, to share anything about it. So sorry, you're going to have to wait longer. Uh, but I'm glad that you're excited about it. That makes me feel good. Makes me feel a little bit nervous that like after all of this waiting, whatever we come up with had better be great. Uh, so that's intimidating, but we're doing our best. Uh, but yeah, we're not in a position to share anything because just so much is still up in the air. We don't want to give you a bunch of information that's just going to be wrong. <laughs> so Captain Biggie points out that yeah, when, when it's not public, he can talk your face off. Uh, if, if you're chatting, if he's chatting with someone in person, it just, the, yeah, and the thing that's actually interesting is I get more intimidated by interpersonal conversations where I'm like with a person and I have to be like, you know, relating to them as a human being. Like I'm actually more intimidated by that because like that person, like they're actually like, you know, when I'm performing, I'm just putting on a show. Like I'm like, uh, you know. I'm like a clown and the clown makeup is all you can see. It's not really me, you know, I'm not, myself is not really on the line the same way when I'm performing than when I'm actually trying to relate to another person in, like individually. Then it's like, oh, if I do something wrong or say something dumb in this context, um, they just think I'm dumb. I'm not putting on a show that went wrong. They actually just think I'm a dumb guy. <laughs> and so I, I feel like I've got a lot more, there's a lot more stakes in like real interpersonal relationships than there are in performance. And so performance is actually, is, is a fun way for me to sort of get this kind of like social energy going without actually having nearly as much on the line. Okay. So. Was this the last Project Zomboid episode for a while? I did go around and I cleared out all the nearby buildings. I was encountering zombies, but I was encountering them in fives and sixes instead of in seventeens and twenty-fives. Um, they could still wander into my area, but that's always going to be true in, in West Point at uh, Survivor difficulty. I think we might have just accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. I might take some time on my own without taking a lot of risks to just like organize my house and, and try to sort of get things ready. But then I think I might actually just switch at this point to playing, you know, playing Project Zomboid on my own, having my own adventures, just, you know, rekindling my uh, sort of intrinsic love of the game. And then sometime when, maybe after update 42 drops, or maybe some other time, if I just come up with a reason why I want to stream some more Project Zomboid, um, I'll come back to it. Uh, so yeah, so Captain Binky, I am really looking forward to, I mean, all the stuff you guys have been announcing about what you've been working on, I'm really looking forward to it. And I still, you know, don't, if I do take a break from streaming Project Zomboid, it's only because I love the game and I want to intensify my love for it, rather than just getting tired because I'm streaming it all the time. Oh yeah, so Captain Binky says, maybe one day you and I will be at the same games event and we can run this experiment and find out which one of us is more socially awkward in person. That sounds great. I look forward to it. 
Uh, if we ever do end up, yeah, because I don't know when we would because we're across an ocean from each other. So we probably, you know, uh, Gamescom is a little and like Res probably a little easier for you. PAX at E3 are a little easier for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I would love to do that sometime. I'd love to meet you in person, Captain Binky. Um, and with that, I think we should end this episode. So there's a subscribe button. When I do come back to play Project Zomboid again on this stream, which I will, I'm going to link that there. It might be a while, though, so I don't know what's in that slot. Some random thing.